Okay, so back in session two, we introduced this idea of institutions, and uh, we defined it in a specific way, a really broad way. Um, normally, when you think of an institution, you think of something with like an actual building, like Congress is an institution, there's a Capitol building, the White House is an institution, the office of the presidency lives in the White House. These are kind of official formal institutions that exist in society to help govern society. Um, but back in session two, we actually expanded that definition to mean something a lot broader. Um, we talked about this right here, where institutions are laws and rules and regulations, these kind of actual formal written down things. But institutions are also um, customs and norms and kind of moral injunctions and things that help shape our behavior. And these have nothing to do with actual laws. There's no... Um, there's no office for norms that exists in the in the government, um, but we still follow norms. We still tip our, our our waiters because that is what society says to do. It is an institution that exists. It's not a formal institution, um, but it's something that we follow because that's what we're supposed to do. And so the fact that we follow it means that it is an institution. It's something that governs our behavior. Um, you saw kind of the importance of these institutions when I had you read or had you listen to this uh, podcast episode here where they, the Freakonomics team interviewed a whole bunch of different economists about um, how they would set up an economy if they had a completely blank slate, uh, meaning if they got rid of all of the institutions that currently exist and could shape their own institutions, um, how would that look in kind of a new earth, um, earth 2.0 here? And the really interesting thing about this is some of the economists said that you can't do this. Like there's some sort of institutional history that shapes all of the, the institutions we have nowadays. And so if you started brand new, you would import a whole bunch of these same institutions. Like we have money. It exists as kind of a system for exchanging value. Um, if you decided to create something for Earth 2, we're going to create money um, because... Um, we already think about that. Um, that's kind of inculcated in our um, in our whole way of reasoning about society, um, and so we will kind of we're kind of locked into the these institutions. Um, even though we would love to get away from them, we're kind of very beholden to them. Um, and that that was kind of the moral of this story is that institutions are extremely important. That their foundation they're the foundation for all of society here, um, and they're really hard to break away from. And one thing that's really interesting in the economics world is for a long time, up until 15, 20 years ago, most economists would ignore institutions um, because they were a tricky thing to study. Um, there are a couple different reasons why. Um, there are pragmatic reasons. Um, so institutions change really slowly and they don't actually matter for lots of the models you're looking at. You can do indifference curves and budget lines without considering um, kind of the institutional mix of the person making budgetary choices. All you're really doing with budget lines and indifference curves is drawing the line using calculus to see where it touches. That has nothing to do with institutions. And so economists who live in the budget line and difference curve world don't care about institutions. There's no actual reason why to do it. Um, and so pragmatically, like when you're looking at these very, very mathematical models, you don't really need to consider the overarching rules and norms that shape society. Um, or so economists argued up until even the 1980s and 1990s. Um, another reason why economists have ignored these things for a long time is for ideological reasons. Um, because institutions are constraints. And one of the reasons we care about economics is because it lets us operate essentially without constraints. Um, liberty and freedom come from operating in the market. And so if you can exchange whatever your, good, like your goods and services with other people, um, then if you have total freedom to do that, then that's awesome and we love that. That's the invisible hand. Hooray. Um, and we don't want constraints with that. And so even Adam Smith in um, his foundational text about the economy where he invented the, or he recognized the concept of the invisible hand, he essentially said that if one person wants to sell something to somebody else, there shouldn't be any constraints to do that. They should just be free to do that without any rules, without any norms saying they shouldn't um, because that's the free market. Um, the issue with that argument though is that whole premise of Adam Smith um, falls apart unless there are constraints. Um, so having a totally free market where everybody can operate and the invisible hand can do its magic um, only works if there are certain conditions. 
you have to have property rights so that you have the right to be able to transfer your property to somebody else. Um, you have to have the right to be able to transfer your property. You might have property rights, but if the rules say you can't give that to somebody else in exchange for money, then you can't. Um, if somebody breaks the contract, um, unless there are constraints and norms, whether they're officially like formally written down with formal enforcement, like a legal system or a justice system, or if they're community-based, where if you cheat on um, a, a deal with somebody, then the community shuns you or kicks you out or something, um, you need some sort of, of enforcement mechanism for this free market to work. In the absence of all of those, it falls apart. You still need kind of the boundaries for this free market. And those boundaries are these institutions. And so it's important to look at those boundaries and to look at what is actually shaping um, these, these interactions that people have. And so I said on the previous slide that you can do indifference curves and budget lines without thinking about institutions. Um, but there's a movement um, in the past few years in economics actually care about that. Um, yes, you're just drawing budget lines and figuring out where it touches. But if you're thinking about institutions, you should think about why the budget is the way it is. Um, you should think about um, the institutional structures that have shaped the budget for a specific person and maybe different policies that might expand that budget, um, especially if you're talking about things like health care um, or um, uh, food or housing or other critical goods. Um, we should think about the institutions that, that shape those structures, even with indifference curves. Um, we're talking about just why people want the things that they want. Um, and generally economists just say that exists. People have preferences for stuff and they like calzones or waffles and hooray. Um, but if you don't think about the institutions that shape these preferences, then you're missing out on a whole bunch of useful information. Um, people might want calzones or waffles or in the case of like the 1970s and 80s when we, when we were trying to reduce the amount of smoking, um, there was a preference for smoking. And it wasn't just because it existed out in the world, it's because there were institutional forces that encouraged um, the consumption of tobacco and um, both within the government and within broader culture. Um, tobacco, the tobacco industry spent lots and lots of money trying to shape our preferences um, by changing our norms for um, smoking and including all sorts of um, paid advertising in TV shows and in radio ads and all sorts of other places so that it became a norm that it's okay to smoke. So that preference for smoking and tobacco use came from some broader institution and broader norm about smoking. And the only way it's been able to change over time wasn't necessarily just because the government has imposed taxes on, on tobacco and so that changes the supply curve. Um, but it's, they've had to manipulate, essentially, um, our preferences for it. And they've had to reshape the norms and um, the moral value that we assign to smoking. Um, and that has changed over the past few decades. And all of that is institutional change. It's not just supply and demand. And so there is value in looking at the institutions instead of just the, the nitty gritty math and moving around lines and figuring out where they cross. So it is important to look at this stuff. I actually find it's way more exciting than, than the lines and the, the dots and the crossings. That's super boring to me and, and fairly useless for the stuff I do. Um, and the stuff I care about, I care way more about you know, the institutional structures where all of this happens and how we can um, use institutions to help improve behavior and improve society and create you know, better, more equitable outcomes for people. So for economists, back in the, starting in the 80s-ish, um, early 90s, they started looking or taking institutions more seriously and looking at them as something that you can study with economics. Um, and there are three general ways of understanding institutions using the language of economics. So we're going to briefly talk about these three. Um, spoiler alert, the last of the three is kind of the best, most um, accepted way of looking at this now. Um, and you'll see why as we talk about this. So one way of looking at institutions is as kind of rational behavior, um, that people follow rules because it's in their own self-interest and it meets their utility functions and they're maximizing their utility by following rules. Um, you can also look at institutions as constraints or rules of the game that you're supposed to follow. Um, and then this final way is we can look at institutions as temporary equilibrium or temporary equilibria in a game. 
just like a game theory. So I'll talk about each of these three uh, ways of, of looking at institutions, and we'll give some examples. So with institutions as rational choices or, or rational behavior, the underlying theory here is that people follow rules um, people don't murder, people don't cheat and lie, because it fits within their rational utility functions. So really, this idea here of people following norms and rules is really you do it because it fits within your cost-benefit calculus. Um, and the, the benefits outweigh the costs, and so you follow the rules because of that. Um, and so it, it really just kind of boils the whole idea of following norms um, and rules down to just basic math. Um, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Um, a good example of this, um, where people have been thinking about this, this, this fits within the, the world of ethics. This is uh, utilitarianism, essentially, where you choose the option that gives you the most utility. So if you're trying to act ethically, you'll choose the choice. If you have some ethical dilemma, you choose the choice that creates the most utility for society. Um, this is the same idea, but for creating the most utility for yourself. Um, a few years ago, or back in a few years ago, in the 90s, the uh, TV show The Twilight Zone um, had an episode where there was a guy who showed up at this couple's house with a box that had a button in it. Um, and he told them that if they pushed the button, somebody somewhere out in the world would die but they would get some huge amount of money. I think it was like a million dollars if they pushed this button and somebody they don't know out in the world would die. And so the whole episode are these two um, staring at this button and debating whether or not they should hit it. Um, and you can look at the whole, you can watch the whole episode on YouTube. It's like half an hour long. Um, it's very, very early 90s aesthetic. It's, it's kind of wacko. Um, but in the end, they decide to hit the button and they kill somebody and they get the money for it. And so that decision right there, they broke the rule that we have in society of not killing. We have that as both a law formally written down, but also as kind of a norm. Um, and if they're religious, they probably follow the Ten Commandments, which, and one of those is do not kill. Um, but because they approached this decision as kind of a rational choice, it boiled it down to utilitarianism and they had to decide, is this million dollars worth killing somebody? And in the end, they decided yes. Um, but other things can change that calculus. If they, you can imagine a situation where the person said, if you push this button, somebody you know personally will die and you'll get a million dollars. That would change the actual calculus most likely and they probably wouldn't push it. But if you live in this rational choice world, maybe if the person offered like a hundred million dollars, that suddenly switches the cost benefit analysis and maybe they would push the button. It depends on their utility functions for life and money and the value they place on not murdering. And so this is a really um, kind of cold hearted way of looking at human behavior here, um, where essentially it says people only follow rules because the payoffs are positive. And as soon as the payoffs don't or aren't positive, then people will stop following rules, which is kind of a cynical way of looking at why people follow norms and rules. But that's one way of looking at why um, institutions exist and how people or why people follow institutions. Um, a second way of looking at this is looking at institutions as constraints on behavior. Um, here, you read in um, the North chapter, this is his whole idea, um, that institutions are basically socially imposed constraints on human activity. They're the rules of the game. Um, or humanly shaped, humanly devised constraints that shape human interactions. Um, they're things that help shape our behavior. Um, and they can be both formal and informal. Um, for instance, when we talk about institutional formality, you can have formal rules and you can have informal rules. Um, and they both are pretty powerful. So formal institutions are things that are actually written down, they're codified either in law or in some regulations. Um, they're backed by formal enforcement mechanisms. If you break these things, there are written down things that happen to you as punishment. Um, there's also informal institutions which are slightly different. There's still expectations. You're still supposed to follow these things. Um, but there's nothing formally written down that happens to you if you mess up or if you don't, um, don't follow the rule. There's still punishment 
But these are things more like customs and conventions or etiquette, where the, the punishment is not like you go to jail or anything like that. The punishment is more um, getting yelled at in society or um, getting, um, facing some sort of social sanction. And we see this kind of split between formal institutions and informal institutions all over the place. And once you recognize this difference and recognize the importance of informal institutions, you'll recognize this more and more. Um, for instance, in soccer, there are official rules that determine what happened, like what constitutes a penalty, um, what constitutes a goal scored, where people are supposed to stand on the field, what positions there are. There's an offsides rule if somebody's too far up the field. There's a whole bunch of written down codified rules. And if you break those rules, then there's some sort of punishment. Um, you get a foul called on you. You might lose a player. You might get a red card, other things like that. There are also informal institutions that shape a soccer game. For instance, if somebody gets injured and the opposing team has the ball, the informal rule is the opposing team is supposed to kick the ball out of bounds um, and wait for the medic to come onto the field and wait until they resolve whatever injury there was. And then the, because the opposing team kicked it out, it was, they were the last ones to touch it. And so the team who had the injury, they get the ball first and they get to throw it back in. None of that is written down anywhere. Um, that is not in the official like FIFA rule book. It's just a thing that you do um, because it is kind. It's kind of the etiquette that you have in the sport. Um, all sorts of sports have these rules um, where there's official formal rules, but then there's also kind of unofficial things you're supposed to do because it's the polite thing to do. And you follow that because you're supposed to, um, because there's this expectation to. And if you don't, um, if there's an injury, and the opposing team and you have the ball and you run up and like score a goal while they're trying to tend to this this person who's injured um you're gonna get booed significantly um people are gonna hate you um for years because you just look bad and so the fact that you have this social sanction that's threatening you makes it so that you actually follow the rules and don't um don't cheat so we care about institutions, both formally, things that are actually written down, and informally. And they're both fairly powerful. Um, and they shape all sorts of interactions that we have with society. Um, for instance, so if we, if we ask this question here, let me jump up to it with institutional formality. Um, there's this really interesting question here of which is more powerful in shaping our behavior. Are formal institutions or informal institutions more powerful? Do we obey etiquette and community norms or do we obey laws? And there's no clear answer to this um, in all sorts of situations. We see this um, right now in 2020, one of the big debates um, following the um, protests, uh, following um, the police brutality throughout May and June. Um, is there's this movement to defund the police and to uh, convert control over enforcement of laws from kind of the legal system and the police system to a community-based system where people who break laws are no longer, like the movement or the rationale here is that people who break laws don't necessarily need to be arrested and sent to prison for some number of years, but instead you can use informal community mechanisms that help um, sanction them um, that help reform them and relying on kind of an informal community around that person to improve behavior and, and search for justice and restitution. Um, it's a different way of approaching um, kind of this, this social norm here of enforcing the social norm that rather than relying on kind of this impartial, cold, distant, removed justice system that's formally written down, it turns to the more informal side um, that uses community sanctions and community support and community relationships to also enforce norms. Um, under both systems, you should not like injure people or lie to people or rob people, um, but the enforcement mechanism is different. Um, one is a formal institution, one is an informal institution, but they're both fairly powerful. Um, also, there's often no clear divide between formality and informality. So if we think about you know, community policing, um, and community um, restitution and judgment and justice and stuff. Um, technically, that is an informal institution because it's not codified in law, but 
though they will have kind of a charter or some sort of system that they follow that is written down, it's just not like law um, passed by a state legislature or a city council or something like that. And so it's informal, but it's still formal to some extent. Um, this is tricky because informal institutions often just kind of exist out in the world, um, but they can sometimes get distilled into some level of formality. So an example of this, there's a whole bunch of informal institutions that exist out in the world. Um, for instance, wearing a hat in church um, in the South is apparently a huge faux pas. You're not supposed to do that if you're a male, but if you're um, a woman, it's, you can do that and you can wear all sorts of cool hats. Um, there's no formal written down rule that determines what you can do. It does not say you cannot wear a hat or you can wear a hat. It's just kind of a social norm that exists. Um, tipping in restaurants, there's no formal rule that says you are supposed to tip. Um, but we do it because you're supposed to. And if you don't, um, and if you have a huge bill, um, often you'll get dragged on Twitter or on Tumblr or on Facebook because you didn't leave a tip and people will try to shame you. There's community shaming there, but it's not written down. Um, and there's a fairly strong norm for tipping for restaurants. There's also a norm that's been growing over the past few years to tip at hotels, but it is far less strong and, le and far less known than this, this idea of tipping at a restaurant. Um, there's been all sorts of articles over the past few years saying like you're supposed to tip, leave a tip at the hotel you're staying at and tons of commenters like in the comments will say, I didn't know this, what, this is like news to me. Um, it was news to me as well back when I first saw these, these articles five years ago. Um, and so now I do it, but that was like a new norm that I had just stumbled into and, and now I know about it and now I do it. Um, during the pandemic, we've also seen this um, tipping norm where um, what you should do because society is saying to do it um, is to tip um, people from DoorDash or Instacart or the different delivery services that you might be using to give them kind of an extra tip because they are risking their lives being um, out in the public, um, bringing you food and stuff. Um, and there are social sanctions for that. Again, like if you don't tip um, a DoorDasher, you, will, you won't personally get in trouble, but they could turn to the internet and kind of um, sick the sick public shame on you. Um, a few in early uh, early days of the pandemic, I think in like May or April of 2020, um, there was this thing where lots of DoorDashers were showing um, on their apps that they would see that somebody had offered like a $50 tip. Um, and so they would like accept the job and go get the food. And on their way, just as they were coming to deliver the food, the person would remove the tip. And they were only including that tip so that they could encourage um, really fast delivery. Um, but as soon as the food was on the way, they would say, oh, just kidding, we're not going to tip. And so that was like wrong. And there was all sorts of outrage about that because it violates all sorts of social norms. You shouldn't do that. that that's cheating. Um, but none of that is written down anywhere. That's just kind of an informal norm that you're supposed to have. Um, lawns, the very fact that we have in the United States, this idea that you should have grass in your front yard. Um, that is an informal institution that just exists because of weird historical trends, and that's why we have lawns. Um, there are instances where that can get codified into a formal institution. Um, many homeowners associations require that your grass be a certain length and that you have grass, and if you try to do like xeriscaping or something with, with no grass, you'll get in trouble, and there's actually like formal sanctions in homeowners associations, and it's bizarre. Um, but in theory, like at its base, this idea of having lawns is this informal institution that we just have in society. Formal wear um, at like awards banquets. This is also a weird informal institution that we have um, where men wear tuxedos and that's it. And women wear all sorts of really, really fancy designer dresses. And um, all of the focus when you have like awards season is on um, kind of women's fashion and men are just wearing their tuxes with their bow ties. Um, the reason that exists is because there's a form informal institution that says that is how men and women should dress. Um, it's not written down anywhere. It doesn't, there's no rule in like the Oscar um, guidebook for going to the Oscars that says men must wear tuxes and women must wear fancy dresses. That's just how it is in society. Um, and it's a rule that people follow. Um, some other examples that are more serious, corruption 
in um, a city or in a state or in just any sort of government is an informal institution. It's not written down, but if you show up and say, I want this government service, and you know that there's a culture of corruption, you kind of have to follow the unspoken rules and pay up um, or get very little access to government services. And that is kind of this informal, it's not codified anywhere, but you're still supposed to follow it if you want faster government services. It's bad, um, but it's still an informal institution that exists out in the world. Okay, so informal institutions are important. They make society go smoother. Um, they help with all sorts of um, coordination issues. If we think back to collective action problems and social dilemmas, um, the whole purpose of having institutions is to help us get over um, collective action problems and fix social dilemmas. Um, one really good example of this here in real life is um, construction on the freeway. Um, technically, when you're merging, when a, when a lane is closing on the freeway, um, the most Pareto optimal choice that you should follow is to stay in the lane that is closing until the very end and then move over. So you basically wait until the very last minute and then you move over. Um, what, um, what this professor here is saying is that if you're a generous driver and you purposely move over like half a mile early, um, that's nice, but it is also like slowing down traffic. It, act, it slows down the flow of traffic because the lane that's still moving suddenly gets really crowded and you get all sorts of traffic there and the lane that's ending in like half a mile is completely empty. And so you should, in theory, keep going all the way down. Um, and then later she says this, like if you have a zipper merge situation, everybody moves faster if you go all the way to the merge point and then move over. Um, she even uses Pareto language here. So move, getting in line early is not Pareto optimal. And so this is great. This is a great idea that this is the institution we should follow. Um, you should wait until the very last minute and then merge in. But me personally, even though I know this is true, I do not do this um, because I am terrified of doing it. Um, because we have this weird social norm that says don't do that because that feels like you're cutting in line. Um, and so often if you do go all the way up to the front of the line and then move over, you'll get honked at and yelled at and people will be really mad at you because they'll often think you should have gotten in way back when I did and they get mad because you're cheating. Um, it's not cheating, this is the way you should be doing it, but another informal norm says you should not zoom up ahead in the empty lane. Um, you should suffer like everybody else who did the suboptimal thing. Um, and so it's tricky because you have these um, or you have these confounding norms here, these confounding informal institutions. And which one do you choose? Um, I always opt for not, um, not going to the very end and just um, sitting in traffic longer so I don't get yelled at, even though it's suboptimal. And then when we talk about collective action problems, me doing that means that other people will do it. Um, and so we're stuck in this bad equilibrium here where everybody's merging too early and we're punishing the people who are doing the right thing by going to the very end and then merging in. So it, it's tricky. And so we should care about these things because we can explain lots of things in society um, based on how people follow um, institutional norms, whether they're formal or informal. Okay, so the last way of looking at institutions is to look at it using game theory. Um, so here we look at institutions as the equilibria from a game. So the reason why this is important is because it explains why people follow some rules and ignore other rules. If we only look at institutions as rules that shape behavior, that's helpful, but it doesn't actually tell us why people disobey some rules and why they obey some other rules. Um, why, again, we, when we talked about the zipper merging, um, we could tell a story about it saying like people don't zipper merge at the very, very end because they, they face social sanction and they're afraid of that. And so that, that might explain why they're, they're moving in. Um, but that's all we can really say about it. If we think about game theory and think about payoffs, we can actually think more deeply about these institutions and why people are following them and how we can get people to follow them better. Um, and so a good example of this is this picture right here. This is a train in India. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of research done on the railway system in India. Um, they found that in general, one million Indians don't have seats on trains. They don't pay for seats. 
they either hang on to the outside of the train or get in um, without tickets. And technically, you're supposed to follow the rule. You're supposed to buy a ticket to be able to get on the train. But millions of people don't. Um, and so why is that? Um, and according to the institutions as rules people, this is just because, like, this is weird because there are rules. It should constrain human behavior, but they're not being constrained by it. So not a good rule. Um, according to the rational choice people, they're saying that these people are making, they're maximizing their utility by breaking the rule and getting on without a ticket. Um, in the game theory world, though, what ends up happening is these people are making a choice to not pay because their payoffs are fairly high for not paying. You can technically get ticketed for not, or you can get fined for not, ha for not having a ticket here. And so if you are one of these people on the train, one of the, the ticket takers could pull you off the train and say, You're, you didn't pay, here's your fine. Um, but if we think about this in game theory world, the probability of that happening is super low, especially if thousands of people are on the outside of this train, the odds that you're going to be singled out are pretty low. Um, and the payoff of you not getting singled out is pretty high. And so it ends up like a game where you have the, the ticket takers and you have the, uh, the train riders. And so they decide to ride on the train without paying because their payoffs are fairly high and the probability of being caught is pretty low. And so it ends up being a game. And this helps explain this behavior. And it helps explain changes in this behavior. If the Indian Railway Company decided to crack down on this and they hired thousands of more ticket takers, or if they lowered the price of tickets substantially, um, those are little levers that you can play with in the game. It changes the probability of being caught, it raises that, or it lowers the payoffs that you get for not paying for a ticket. And by doing that, you can actually encourage more people to follow the rules because the payoffs will encourage them to follow the rules. Um, it ends up being a game. Um, so in this world, institutions, the actual norms and the rules that we see out in the world are the outcomes of games. And the decision to, to follow a rule or to have a rule exist or a norm exist is really just based on the payoffs that you see and the repetition that players have as they continue to, to work through this game here. Um, there are three different types of, of outcomes here um, with these games and these institutions. You have self-enforcing institutions, you have self-reinforcing institutions, and you have self-undermining institutions. And so we'll talk about each of these examples here. Um, all of these deal with repeated games. So as you interact with somebody, um, you'll settle on some sort of arrangement, and then the next time you interact with them, you'll settle on another potential arrangement. Um, those are self-enforcing institutions, where the, the institution itself, the rules that you decide on, gets stronger over time. Um, and that's because you fall in a Nash equilibrium. So if we go back to Anil and Bala here with this, this two by two game here, this is the, a, a driving game, essentially chicken here, where they both have to choose which side of the road to drive on. If they both decide to drive on the left, then they'll live. If they both decide to drive on the right, then they'll also live. Um, if one decides to drive on the left and one decides to drive on the right, then they will crash and that will be bad. And same if one decides right and one decides left. And so you want one of these options here, the live-live option or the uh, either of the live-live options here. So the reason this is self-reinforcing is it doesn't really matter which of these live-live options you land on if they're passing each other on the road and they both drive on the left so they don't crash into each other, then the next time they run into each other on the road, they're probably going to choose left-left or right-right, whichever one they did before, because they know that that worked and they didn't die when they passed each other. And so they'll eventually, every time they interact with each other, settle on something that works well. And then that creates kind of a, a deeper institution. It kind of ingrains it, um, creates ruts, where that's the thing that you're supposed to do in society. Um, these things aren't always life or death situations, um, like driving on a road really fast. Um, so we've talked about this um, back in session two, but in the United States, what is the norm for when two people are trying to go through a doorway at the same time? Um, there are conflicting norms depending on where you live. It could be the older person goes first, it could be the woman goes first, it could be the younger person goes first, it could be the person with the most amount of stuff in their arms goes first, something. 
Um, and so the very first time two people in a society run into each other at a doorway, whatever they decide, if they, if one, if they decide older person goes first, the next time those two people run into each other, um, they're most likely going to do the same thing. And then the next time they run into each other, they're probably going to do the same thing again. And then if one of those people who knows to let the, the older person go first, um, runs into somebody else, they will probably defer to them if they're older. And then this norm spreads. And it's really just because in that very first interaction, the game worked, the payoffs were good. Um, they didn't crash into each other. They didn't drop everything they were holding. And the institution worked, and so they just go with it. And so as this repeats over and over and over again, you get cultural norms emerging, and it just it works. It has been um, enforced. Um, Self-reinforcing institution is similar. Um, it's just the, the norm gets stronger and stronger and it's really hard to switch away. Um, where the, the institution or whatever equilibrium you land on actually entrenches itself. So with passing in the doorway, um, if you run into somebody and you decide to let the older person go first, that's cool. You've settled on that norm. But if you move to like a different city, um, and they have different norms, you'll catch on pretty quick. And maybe women go first there. And so you'll catch on fairly quick there. You move to a different city, they'll have some other norm, you catch on. Um, and so the norms don't get deeper and deeper and deeper. They work and they're pretty settled, but you can switch around fairly quickly. Um, with self-reinforcing institutions, this is where it gets hard to switch away because the thing gets more and more codified. So with Anil and Bala, if they're just driving by each other and they decide, oh, I remember this person, I'm going to drive on, like we're going to split so we don't run into each other, that works as, as kind of a self-enforcing institution. The self-reinforcing institution, though, is if they decide to put signs up that say, drive on this side of the road, then everybody else is going to start driving on that side of the road. The car manufacturers in their country are going to start creating cars that drive on the right side of the road. So you'll have more and more right-sided cars. And so everybody gets really, really entrenched in this because all of society is suddenly shaped around that cultural norm that they decided on as they were just passing each other. Um, and so if you want to change and switch away to something else, it gets really hard to do because you have to change all of the road signs and you have to change all of the cars. You have to get rid of all the right-sided cars and switch to left-sided cars if you want to reverse the how the rules are for driving. And so that's a very deeply entrenched institution that you have to deal with. Um, you can also have self-undermining institutions where because the institution is getting stronger and the norms are getting stronger, it can actually lock you into a bad outcome that makes it worse off for everybody. Um, so an example of this, if we go back to driving here, um, you could have a situation where in one country everybody um, drives on the right side of the road and they want to increase tourism to their country and so they say, come everybody. Um, but most of the world drives on the left, for instance. And so tourists coming to that country don't like coming to that country because it's hard for them to switch. And so as a result, the tourism industry suffers and so people start agitating for change. And so people push for a change in the institution. So the fact that um, these rules exist actually pushes people away from the existing institution. It changes the payoffs and makes it so you move away from one working Nash equilibrium to the other Nash equilibrium. Um, so in all three of these situations here, you have the self-undermining institutions, you have the self-reinforcing institutions, and you have self-enforcing institutions. In all of these situations, you can actually draw out a game theory matrix that shows the payoffs for following the rule and for not following the rule. And according to these institutionalists who study institution or who study institutions as games, you can actually predict how people will respond to changes in rules. Um, because you can predict, like, if you change payoffs or change probabilities, that changes people's behavior and it changes the Nash equilibrium that they end up on. Um, and so you can actually predict changes in behavior based on game theory and changes in rules based on game theory, which is one reason why it's become kind of a popular way of looking at, at norms and institutions and rules and regulations um, because um, it explains a lot about how institutions emerge and how they can go away and how they can change. Um, so if we go back to this list here, the summary of these different institutional approaches in economics, we have this rational choice idea where you're only making choices because it fits your utility function. 
you push the button um, to kill somebody in a random place on the earth because a million dollars is worth it to you, and so that's cool. Um, some people might have other thresholds, but according to these people, everybody has a threshold somewhere, and you'll hit it at some point. Um, the issue with this is this ignores external factors. It ignores norms that say don't kill. Um, this essentially says you can get rid of those norms with enough money, which isn't necessarily the case. So you can also look at institutions as rules, um, which makes sense. These are the constraints on behavior. This is the idea that um, if you're playing soccer and somebody gets injured, you should kick the ball out because that's what the official etiquette for soccer says to do. And if you don't, then there's sanction and you don't want to suffer those sanctions. Um, and so that, that makes sense. This is a good way of approaching institutions. The issue here, though, is it doesn't explain how those rules change over time, and it doesn't explain why sometimes people ignore the rules or why there's uneven enforcement. Um, looking at institutions through a game theory lens as equilibria does explain this. It explains why rules change. They might be self-undermining or self-reinforcing, and so they'll naturally evolve over time. And it explains why there's uneven enforcement. If the payoffs are too low, or if the probability of being caught or being sanctioned is too low, then the payoffs say, don't follow the rule. But if you can increase the probability of getting caught, if you can increase the payoffs for following the rule, then people will follow the rule more naturally. And so it's a good mix of this rational choice idea and the institutions as rules idea, but it explains a lot more about institutional change and why the rules exist the way they do out in society. So institutions are really important. Um, you'll notice these when you, again, as you get jobs and go out into the world, you'll want to start changing behavior of your employees um, or of your departments. And it might be really hard because they might be locked into um, kind of a specific game theory equilibrium where it says we're going to follow these rules because these are the payoffs. And so rather than just saying, here's my new policy, good luck changing that. Um, instead, if you can figure out the levers that you can manipulate to change the payoffs or change the probabilities, that's going to be way more effective in changing behavior than just like having an edict that says um, casual Fridays are now a thing or something like that. Um, it's really hard to impose your own rules because everybody's just playing a game and following um, the game theory payoffs. So institutions are very important.